You're watching Reason and Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussions, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. And welcome to Reason and Theology, everyone. Your host, Michael, on a Saturday here, joined by in-studio guest, the man, the <laughs> myth, the legend, William Albrecht. How are you, sir? Thrilled to be here with you, brother. Um loving it here and i'm gonna have a great time talking with you as well look william i need you to verify something for me because I, i'm not sure that everybody really believes me can you tell me are these books made of cardboard the cardboard <laughs> he said they're cardboard <laughs> we've got to get a short little video with me uh -huh. my hand on the wall yeah 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 <laughs> and, and taking one of the books out and then reading it <laughs> <laughs> the, it, the books are real they are a hundred percent real <laughs> i can verify yeah yeah he, he's been able to verify so we have had the man himself come out and certify all right now tell me a little bit about yourself just for maybe some of the viewers who might not be familiar with your work tell me about your channel you know your background yeah i believe you're a convert stuff like that. i am so i'm a convert from reformed protestantism uh I debate a lot. I debate a lot. So uh, my channel, people can find it, uh, Patristic Pillars. They can find a lot of stuff I do there. Mm -hmm. They can find a lot of stuff I do here, Reason Theology. Mm -hmm. We're a team together, you, myself, Eric. Uh, we do a lot of work together. Um, I debate pretty much any topic defending the Catholic faith. I converted, I want to say about two decades ago now, Michael, at least two decades oh, wow. ago, uh, became... Well, it was a bit of a journey. So I uh, discerned orthodoxy before Catholicism, okay. heavily discerned it. I uh, still have great respect for my Eastern brothers and sisters. Right. But uh, ultimately, uh, I, am, I reached a point where I believed Catholicism was the fullness of the faith, the mm. fullness of the truth. And I'm still fully convicted of that today. And uh, one of the key reasons, Michael, is something we're going to talk about today. Yeah. Um, I think it's a very important topic, uh, the Immaculate Conception. Very, very fun. And uh, I got to say, I'm thrilled to be here. It's great to be here in office. It's amazing here, here in the studio. Dude, it's an honor to have you. And and, and I'm kind of curious. So so was it the Marian doctrines that was kind of the deal breaker for you between Orthodoxy and Catholicism? Or was it something else and that just kind of factored in? Or? The Marian dogmas played a, a role. But I've got to be honest, the papacy played a huge role. Yeah, as well. for me. Yeah. It's got to be the papacy. So the papacy played a real big role. The Marian dog. And look, Michael, I know people, I know what my Eastern brothers and sisters will say. Mm -hmm. They're going to tell me, um, well, uh, the Immaculate Conception is, is a theological opinion that some may hold. The problem with that, Michael, is, as you know very well, within Orthodoxy, they've moved further and further away from that to yeah. where now uh, it is a theological opinion that may be looked down upon yeah and one that really is not one that they recommend people hold you have some of the theologians that very strongly oppose it yeah um and when i say theologians i mean some other scholars as people may know i've debated one of them reverend dr ramsey on that particular topic so in my opinion what which apostolic faith gives the greatest honor and glory to Holy Mary mm -hmm. that can be found in Catholicism. And then we look in particular at what the Immaculate Conception is. And I think that the fullness of that truth about Holy Mary is within Catholicism. And, and before we dive in on the topic of the Immaculate Conception, I, I want to know a little bit more about your background, because I've seen your content yeah. for years before I ever had you on the show. Yeah. I've seen your content floating around on YouTube, especially debates. Yeah. In fact, I think the first time I came across you was a discussion or something like that that you had with James White, Dr. Right. James White. Yeah. Um, so I've seen that you've done a lot of debates, a yeah. lot of apologetic work for quite a while now. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about that. How did you get into apologetics? So I got into it kind of um, kind of in, in a very odd way. I, I reached out to James. Yeah. And I had the desire to dialogue with him mm. about multiple things in the faith. It ended up into a kind of like a little mini debate with him on the air. Yeah. After that, I got in touch with um, Alpha and Omega, became uh, acquaintances and then later friends with Turretin fan. 
Oh, yeah. I've been debating him for over two decades. <laughs> look, now. look, just just for those who might not be familiar with Turretin fan. So T fan is a Protestant debater. We've had him on the show multiple times. Yeah. Great guy. But the funny thing is, <laughs> and I and I wasn't expecting to say this, but since he came up, the funny <laughs> thing is, before William came out of the tunnel when I went to, you know, just get him from the airport. So before you came out of the tunnel. There was a guy who came out who looked exactly like T Fan. <laughs> and I, I'm serious. I thought, did William just bring T Fan to Monroe so that he could have an in person debate? Is, is, that, what, is that what's going on here right now? <laughs> and Michael, the, the incredible thing about that that you bring up is the fact that I've debated so much that mm. it probably wouldn't su have surprised you. <laughs> I've been debating for a very long time. Um, it, it began regular phone and then radio interviews i would okay. do debating but the the thing with debates that i do is i put a lot of time and effort yeah because i realize that none of what i'm doing is for my glory none of it come on i don't i don't desire glory uh what i want is to give as much honor to holy mother church as can be mm -hmm. and i realize that people out there are hearing Mm -hmm. They may be going through a tough, dark time, as I was at one time before I converted. I was, you know, what discerning. Yeah. And uh, there's a little bit of period, as you know very well, when you're discerning, when you feel a little lost. Like, okay, well, uh, I'm going to uproot uh, m friendships. I'm going to lose friendships, yeah. uh, family members, because I'm going to abandon Reformed Protestantism. So my goal when I do that is to help people that may need that help. And uh, therefore, I put in a lot of time and effort in debating. And uh, when it comes to debates, of course, we have a little treat for the audience. We'll talk about that later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, speaking about this, it seems like you do have a focus on the Marian doctrines. Yeah. And one thing that I kind of pick up on is that you want to honor Our Lady. Yeah. Is that accurate? It really is, Michael. And I have such a great love and devotion for St. Mary. Uh, I love her. Um, and I uh, I venerate her. I, I give her the veneration she is due. I love our holy Teotokos. And I think uh, it, it is a great inspiration for me when I, unfortunately, I see the attacks yeah. against Mary. And I notice that it, it usually stems from a, a poor Christology when they mm -hmm. have a poor Mariology. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that. And uh, I think that uh, Mary really should be honored. And uh, one of the particular areas that gives Mary her due honor and veneration is what we mean when we talk about Mary's immaculate conception, which really does tend to confuse people a lot, Michael. But I think yeah. when you when you break it down, uh, I think it is it, without a doubt it is clearly, strongly taught in Scripture and the early church as well. What exactly do we mean by the immaculate conception? Because yeah. I think that there is an incredible amount of confusion here. So when we say that the Virgin Mary um, is Im immaculately conceived, you know. On the moment of her conception yeah. what does that mean so we look at the apostolic constitution from 1854 by the pope and we read uh, that mary was was preserved from the stain of original sin okay uh from the moment of her conception so let me break it down very simply for the audience mm. mary was created mm -hmm. her creation was completely immaculate no sin at all mm -hmm. now the language of stain is very biblical it comes from the book of psalms either yeah. 50 or 51 depending on what edition of the scripture you're looking at right and that is talking about original sin we believe mary was born without that now where do we get that mm -hmm. well michael we look as the early fathers did to mm -hmm. genesis 3 where there is a messianic prophecy right after the fall yeah. so it's right in the context of the fall of mankind and in that messianic prophecy we have uh, an enmity, a kind of mortal warfare barrier placed between the Messiah and the serpent, the devil. Well, that barrier is also placed there for the woman. We know that woman is Mary. So if, if in the very same vein, there would be that enmity between the, the devil and Christ, as well as Holy Mary, the early fathers viewed that and saw that, that, well, it's incredibly powerful language because it's right in the context of talking about original sin. Well, it's very clear. Holy Mary would never be under the dominion of the devil. And of course, there's much more evidence in Scripture, Michael, much more evidence in the early church fathers. And, and of course, we have to also be sensitive to the objections of Protestants. And believe it or not, our Eastern brothers and sisters, who we will talk about those today as well. Tell me a little bit more about stain. Yeah. What do we mean by that specifically? Yeah, so I... 
before I, I, I dive right into that, Michael, mm -hmm. let me first off note that within Eastern Orthodoxy, that's a big uh, opposition to it. They're, okay. they're, they're, they're very opposed to that language. They believe that that language is too Latin. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I, I'm, I'm here to tell them that it's not, because right there in the context of talking about original sin, it utilizes a Greek word for stain, and it's utilized multiple times in the New Testament as well. Well, what is that stain? That stain is a kind of moral defect, and that kind of moral defect can lead to more issues such as committing personal sins mm. and lacking sanctifying grace. So that's why the scripture is so very clear that we are born as fallen humans in a fallen state. Mm. Well, we don't believe Holy Mary was born in a fallen state. We don't believe that because Genesis 3 is very clear. Mary would be at complete enmity with mm. a serpent. Mm. Well, when do we en encounter Holy Mary in the Bible? Luke 1, mm -hmm. where the angel greets Mary as kecharitomene. Well, in the Greek, and we know that you can translate it as having fully been graced, but multiple Greek scholars are clear. You can translate that as full of grace. Mm -hmm. Now, what grace is Mary in possession of? Well, if you look at that root word in Ephesians 1, it's talking about all holy, stainless kind of grace. And here's the incredible thing, Michael. When the angel appears to Mary, it's before the overshadowing, mm. before our Lord is even in her womb. She's already in full possession of that grace. So the argument that, well, of course, Mary was full of grace. She had our Lord in her belly. Well, we're not minimizing the importance of that, of course. But when the angel greets her and encounters her, she's already in full possession of that. There's a very clear mm. reason why, because she was created immaculately. What would be the purpose of God doing this with her? I think it, the purpose would be to give true honor and veneration to his mother, mm. to show that uh, this creature, because she's a creature, yeah. human being, this creature would be given such a magnificent role, not only as his mother, Michael, but mm. as we would later see in the Gospel of St. John and the book of Revelation, the mother of the church. This incredible figure can, you, you know, you can look at her, you can see, well, goodness, this woman must have gone through incredible struggles at the cross right. because her only right. son was died a horrible death. A sword will pierce your heart. A sword will pierce yeah. your heart. That's the prophecy of Simeon tells us. But through it all, she's also an incredible example of, of being that one that first heard the word, the logos in Greek. And she kept that word and said, let it be done unto me according to thy word. I think the, the reason being was because her role was so incredible. Mm. And interestingly enough, Michael, when I say that, I am repeating what such incredible luminaries as St. Gregory of Paula must say, Yosef mm. Brienios, who is an Orthodox giant, and Mark of Ephesus, who is a big figure within Eastern Christianity, within Eastern Orthodoxy. Does that mean that these Eastern Orthodox figures taught the Immaculate Conception or that they taught some things that are similar to it? What, what is your perspective? There? My perspective would be, and I've always been very clear, Mark of Ephesus, It's there's no doubt, taught that Mary was immaculately created. Mm -hmm. I mean, he doesn't get into the conceptual kind of language there, which is fine, because you see, he's very, very uh, clear that Mary never was touched by sin ever. Mm -hmm. But when we get to a St. Gregory Palamas, there's no doubt he taught the Immaculate Conception. You look in his homilies, uh, he's very clear about it. Uh, he even talks about the cleansing of Mary's lineage mm. to get to that point of an all pure seed, very similar to the language of St. John Damascene. So I know we'll get to it later. You might ask, well, well what's the purpose of bringing them up? Mm -hmm. Well, the purpose of bringing them up is to show that if these very important figures, even today in Orthodoxy, clearly taught that and today you've got people following along the lines of romanides and other scholars and denying it well what what's going on is there a, there seems to be an evolution in the other direction when it comes to the immaculate conception whereas within catholicism we see a traje trajectory we yeah. we look in the 100s and there's language in the proto evangelium of james michael and mm. in there even though we don't read of conception there, mm -hmm. we read of a birth. And the birth is called a righteous birth. Mary is called the fruit of righteousness. He utilizes the Greek word to there. 
indicating Mary is in possession of righteousness, justice there. So right away, the seeds are already present yeah. very early on. So as time would go on, and we'll, we could talk about it late, later in the show, you, we're going to encounter many more fathers that... Now, here's, here's the one position that I take. I think that even before we get to conception language, Michael, I think we encounter fathers that talk about Mary's immaculate creation okay. without sin, even though they, use, they don't use conception language. But we find that conception language early on as well. You know, you, you mentioned there the Proto-Evangelium of James. Yeah. I've heard people say, but, you know, wasn't this condemned by a pope or something yeah. like that? Doesn't it have things that are heterodox in it? What do you say in response to that? That's a great question, Michael. Mm -hmm. Number one, I would note that the decree that they're referring to were supposedly condemned. It's very doubtful that's even the document being condemned. The reason being, if you look at the other texts listed that are being condemned, they're listing multiple Gnostic texts. Mm -hmm. And then they talk about um, a gospel of James. Okay. It's, it's not clear that that is the one being condemned. But even if it was being condemned, uh, the fact of the matter is we have an early Christian community mm -hmm. and that community believed enough to teach certain things about Mary because they were circula circulating in the early church. By the way, I've read the document. There is nothing yeah. heretical about it. Yeah. I'm not quoting from the Odes of Solomon or, or the Ascension of Isaiah. They're very, very different. Mm -hmm. Now let's let's talk a little bit more about the doctrine and maybe some of the implications yeah. that it might carry. Um, one thing that I've heard often, especially from the Orthodox, um, in objection to the Immaculate Conception, although I understand some Orthodox are okay with the Immaculate Conception, yeah. those who oppose it sometimes do on the grounds that they say, but this would then mean that she uh, did not actually die. Yeah. And of course, you have the Feast of the Dormition of sure. the Theotokos in, in Orthodoxy, so that's not going to be culture. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so, I mean, what, what, what do you say a response here? I mean, it, th does the Immaculate Conception exclude the notion that she could have died? No, it doesn't. No. And let, let's talk about that, because within Catholicism, as you know very well, Michael, uh, you are permitted to, to, you can tell me, you know, William, I don't think Holy Mary died. Yeah. And you're permitted to have the opinion either way. Mm -hmm. Where do I lean? I lean towards Mary towards the dying. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 um, I'm very Eastern heavy. Yeah. Um, and I believe in the Dormition. I truly do believe she, she died and then was taken body and soul into heaven. Or as some fathers taught, some fathers taught of a kind of a very graceful falling asleep and she was taken bodily into heaven. But that's a great question because if, if we're going to, then the talk of original sin enters into the picture mm -hmm. and they'll begin to say, well, you know, William, well, Michael, her death very clearly is because she had original sin. Why else would she die? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that that's a bit of a thorny problem because Enoch and Elijah didn't die. Mm -hmm. I mean, Enoch and Elijah, <laughs> they had original sin. Right. The Bible's clear. They were from the lineage of Adam. Literally, the Greek says they're from the lineage. Now, I, I know. I know very well the argument, Michael. I've heard it a million times where, well, there are the two witnesses that will come back later and they'll die. But that presents a problem. Number one, in the early church, the early church is not unanimous on who those two witnesses are. Some say that it'll be just one and the other will be Moses. Some don't even have any commentary on it. Mm -hmm. But that's even a problem. Even if, even if I were to grant them, Michael, Enoch and Elijah are the two martyrs. Well, that's martyrdom. That's not a natural death. Mm -hmm. Even if I grant them that they came back to be martyred, that doesn't work in their kind of theology because they wouldn't have died a natural death. They would have been killed. Yeah. So there are exceptions. And we look in the book of Hebrews, we realize right there that there really is no indication that they would come back. Uh, we don't have that unanimously taught in the early church fathers. So when it comes to Mary, you might be wondering, well, you know, what do we have on Mary's death? We have an illusion. Mm -hmm. at best in the book of Psalms. And in a bit, uh, I'll get exactly where that is. Mm -hmm. I don't remember off, off the yeah. top of my head, Psalm 108 or 109, I don't remember. Maybe somebody in the audience can help out. Uh, where it does, it, it has a very strong Christological messianic connection. It's preached in the book of Acts. Ta it's arise, O Lord. Oh, yes. You and your ark of holiness, born yeah. the Greek sanctification. Now, 
that is an allusion to uh, a very clearly strong prophecy of the bodily resurrection, but it's mm -hmm. also an allusion to uh, the bodily rising of, of Mary, the ark. Mm -hmm. Now you may wonder, well, you know, William, that's really reading a lot of typology into it. Mm -hmm. Well, the early fathers saw that. Michael. Right. They did. In fact, we have within Mariology kind of like a subset of, uh, of I guess, literature or, or patristic teachings. And we have Dormition, an assumption, fathers, if you will, St. Andrew of Crete, Germanus, Constantinople, St. John Damascene, Deltechnios of Livias, and others. And in those fathers, they utilize that text for the bodily assumption of Mary, the death and the bodily yeah. assumption of Mary. And that's a holy death. So arise, that arc of holiness. So, and then here's the other thing, Michael, is if we look at their language, when they talk about the death of Mary, they're very clear. Mary died, but Mary didn't die because of original sin. Mm. She didn't die because of the way you and me died. It was a very different, higher reason. And I presented that very argument in a debate I had not long back. And, and on the other side, there is really no clear, concise answer to that. And I think that's a strong, strong point for the Catholic side. And, you know, the attestation to the Dormition of the Virgin... I mean, it occurs in the first millennium yeah. on, on the iconostasis that we have right over here. One of the icons is the feast of the Dormition of the Theotokos, yeah. which goes back, um, you know, relatively early in the first millennium. Sure does. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you do have also that liturgical attestation in addition to just, you know, patristic sources. Yeah. So surely we would say. Yeah, that's not incompatible. Her dormition is not incompatible with the Immaculate Conception. We as Catholics can celebrate the feast yep. of the dormition of the Theotokos, especially in the Eastern Catholic tradition. So, no doubt. Yeah, I, you know, I've never really found that to be a major objection or impediment to accepting yeah. the Immaculate Conception. Now, <clears throat> another question that I have, and something that often comes up, mm -hmm. is, okay, well, did the Virgin Mary? Right. We, we've established she does not have actual sin, yeah. um, grave or venial, but did she have <laughs> concupiscence, right? Kind of this yeah. temptation, fleshly temptation to sin, not, not ex assenting yeah. to it, but that disposition, that being curved inwardness. Yeah. Did so, she have that? What we're going to encounter, Michael, in a few early church fathers, and we have to be very clear, uh, we, we reach a period in, in, in church history where you encounter multiple fathers talking about doubt mm. for Mary. Yeah. Um, and we want to be very clear. That would not contradict the, the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. Okay. It would not because uh, it's very clear there, uh, there is a, it's permissible to believe that Mary had what some scholars, fathers, medievals taught was a debit and peccat. Okay. Now, what what that then entails, Michael, is I know the other the objection, the other side will be, well, you know what, you really you're, you're creating it to the point where it's impossible to deny the immaculate conception, mm. but we're not because we're examining the language. And I'll give an example: it would be mm. Basil, Saint Basil the Great, who, who who believed Mary was moved strongly at the death, the crucifixion of, of our Lord. And we encounter similar language, uh, strong language in uh, St. Hilary of Poitiers, um, St. Cyril uh, of Alexandria, St. Fulgens of Ruspe. But the thing being, though, is people might be shocked, Mike, Michael, because on the one hand, they're going to talk about Mary uh, having doubts or, or really struggling at the death of her son. And then in other passages, they talk about her being all holy. Mm. And and very much indicate they believe she was sinless. So mm. this is a permissible view to hold, but then we also have to be very fair, fair because within when you're doing work in Mariology, you don't want to be dishonest with people mm. because you encounter a figure like Saint John Chrysostomos, right. the golden mouth one, mm. who for me has always been quite perplexing, as yeah, you know very right, well. Right. I have always wondered this is what an incredible orator, what an incredible father. Why the harsh language? Do right. You think? I've never understood it. You don't find any other father talking about a hypothetically suicidal Mary. Now, what, is, mm. what does he say about Mary being suicidal? He says, well, had the angel not appeared to her 
and not talk to her and, and let her know what's going on and she had just found out she was pregnant she probably would have gone mad to the point she, she would have uh, become suicidal hmm. that is very powerful language but i also want to emphasize in each one of the areas where where john chrysostom does talk harshly about marrying they're hypotheticals they're hmm. well, what if or, or what if but we want to be very clear hmm. I do not believe John Chrysostom taught the Immaculate Conception. Okay. Um, at best, there are some new texts that indicate it's possible he believed Mary was sinless. Now, I've, I've looked at them. It does seem to indicate to me that he may have believed that happened at a later time. So I don't think he taught the Immaculate Conception. And I think we need to be fair because yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. We right. don't believe every father taught right. it. Yeah, so, that, that doesn't invalidate our position. We, we don't have to say that every father has to attest to a dogma in order yeah. for it to be true and there's nothing wrong with that i think some people michael i think some people get scared and they'll be oh goodness how do we answer that because i've seen answers out there and what you don't want to do is uh misrepresent sure. what the the certain father taught and i think the words of, of uh saint cardinal henry newman mm -hmm. are the best where he points out and he says look I've looked at the fathers when they talk about marrying. Chrysostom is on an island alone. I mean, who else talks about a suicidal yeah, Mary? Right. I have not heard of it in any in any other father. Have you? I haven't, and I can't say when I read the Gospels that I would have ever no. come to the conclusion that she may have been suicidal if no. this or that happened. I no, think. no. But and I, and I love I love John Chrysostom, um, but he does have harsh language, not right. only towards Holy Mary uh towards uh saint mary magdalene as well there's a, a part where he he says uh well mary magdalene wept mm -hmm. uh at the tomb mm -hmm. but uh saint peter didn't because saint peter was uh tougher and stronger so he <laughs> he, he does have some odd language every <laughs> now and then um the fathers are not infallible right <laughs> so there's nothing wrong with reading them right. and saying uh i read that and i, I don't agree with with him on that particular sure. thing so there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, we, we can respectfully disagree with the yeah. fathers revering them for uh, the great contributions Absolutely. to understanding the faith. But that doesn't mean that we have to agree with everything they said. Now, that's correct. Here's one thing that I'm really curious about. And I, I hear it being recirculated recently. Uh, so there's this claim that there are, I don't know, eight <laughs> or nine popes <laughs> that reject the Immaculate Conception. Could you maybe speak to that? Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have the list. Yeah, I could yeah. probably pop it up yeah, here, yeah. though. But, um, well, I, I have to give credit where credit is due. It comes from Alpha and Omega and Turretin Fan, who okay. has done, um, he he is he knows his French language mm -hmm. very well. And he, he went and he looked in the, in the French scholar. He got mm -hmm. the, the list from there. Some of it, he had he added his own to it. So I appreciate yeah. any time you have somebody within Protestantism or any other field doing their homework and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and he does it in a respectful manner, Michael, he does yeah. it. And he says, look, uh, I believe these are problematic for you. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, I've looked at them and, and I don't think there's a case for any of them. Mm -hmm. I've looked at every single one of them. A number of the quotes are fake right now. Is that Turretin fans fault? No, no. It, it, it comes from the fact that this list by and large comes from a, uh, a scholar that was very opposed to even the bodily resurrection of our Lord okay. and to opposed to much veneration of Mary as well. A lot of the quotes are not real. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the other thing. Well, some people I've heard the objection of the other side. Well, well you know what? Uh, some of these quotes are in the, the Petrologia uh, Minie. That really doesn't mean much. I right. know some of them are in there. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that they're legit. You need to look at the latest scholarship. What are the scholars of these figures saying? And I've looked at scholars of a lot of these popes and mm -hmm. they'll say well look this is not part of their corpus mm -hmm. um and then uh, and then a, a lot of the other church uh church fathers and popes one of them being uh pope saint leo the great and i've examined them and there really is no case there there is not a case at all now on the other side michael can we say that there were some that denied the immaculate conception mm -hmm. of course no right. doubt right. not pope so uh we can look at the incredible saint thomas aquinas uh, it's very unlikely he taught the Immaculate Conception. I've, we've done shows with the incredible uh, Dr. Minard, mm. one of the top Thomistic scholars, in my opinion, uh, if not the top. And he's very clear where he says he denied it. So we're fair. We're being very fair. But 
the list of these popes that deny the Immaculate Conception, it really is bunk, Michael. And I hear it get brought up so often. Oh, I, I do too. I, I just heard it again recently. And, and let me recommend the audience mm -hmm. go to Reason and Theology. Look at the debate we had there about yeah. two, two and a half years back. Yeah. Go check that debate out there. Uh, We've done so many debates, yeah. I forgot we had that one. <laughs> we sure did. A very unique one. How many debates have you done? Oh, I'm just curious. Total, Michael, total, well over 70. Wow. Yeah. And and, and I, I only count the debates that I've done that have been moderated. Those are the only ones I count. So I've done quite a bit. I've been debating quite a bit. And it, uh, people have once told me, so you're not going to get tired of it. I, I just fall in love even more and more with the faith. The more and more I study, Michael, I'm very fully convicted of, of our Catholic faith. Yeah, I, uh, boy, I have so many directions I want to go with this, <laughs> but let's maybe uh, say, what is your strongest uh, piece of evidence, biblically, patristically, or some other locus of theology? Um, what is the strongest attestation to the dogma of the Immaculate Conception yeah. in your estimation? It would have to be the fact that there is a clear, a clear chain in the scripture. Genesis 3, we have that enmity between the woman and the devil. That serpent, by the way, is identified as the devil in the book of wisdom. So we know it's a devil. And we realize, Michael, that once we encounter Mary in Luke 1, Mary is in full possession of that all holy grace. But it doesn't end there because we then go to Revelation 12. And it's kind of reaching the pinnacle of everything because there's this prophecy of that incredible enmity. And we realize that it's, it's true because that great serpent of old, in fact, if you look at the Greek, it's the serpent of old, mm -hmm. referring to the devil of the book of Genesis. And what is the devil doing? The devil is after the woman. Mm. Now, I know very well people are going to say, well, isn't the woman the church? Well, there's a dual kind of vision there. You can yeah. look at the woman as a church. Um, a number of fathers said both. Yeah, It's Mary and the church. Mary is the mother of the church. So he, here's the incredible thing. The devil is after the woman. That enmity is a real enmity. The devil hates the woman, mm -hmm. hates her child. And if anybody were to wonder and say, well, Michael or William, you know, that woman is primarily the church. Mm -hmm. Look at the language. The mother of the child, actually it says that the mother, the child, will rule the nations with a rod of iron. Well, that comes from the Psalms, a messianic one, identifying the Messiah. Well, mm -hmm. who's the mother of the Messiah? It's Mary. So Mary is the figure that is portrayed there as well. And she's crowned in the heavens. And right before we get to verse 12, Michael, mm -hmm. 11 ends with that ark in heaven. We believe Mary is the all holy ark. Now, what do we mean by Mary as being the ark? Well, Mary is a new ark. We look at the beautiful language of the old ark in the Old Testament. And then we look at all the parallels of the ark in the new and it can't be a coincidence that particular Greek words used only for greetings, for singing, chanting in front of the ark in the Old Testament, the Greek Septuagint, utilized for Holy Mary. It cannot, a very rare Greek word, by the way. So it cannot be a coincidence. Mary is presented as the new ark of the covenant. The early fathers viewed Mary as, as the new ark. In fact, yeah. here's to me what is a great clincher as well, Michael. When I go into early history after the Bible, the fathers, not just some random name you've never heard mm, of, mm. some of the greatest Christologists of all time viewed Mary as that all holy ark. And then we realized, that, well, okay, well, what does that entail? And they begin talking about how Mary is all holy. And then, of course, we get to a time where they are talking about a conception. And we have to be very fair. I've heard the objection, Michael, where people will say, okay, well, they're using conception language, but do they also have a theology of original sin? And each and every one of those fathers that we've examined, they do have that theology of original sin. And they note Mary's conception was an immaculate one. Hmm. I, one thing that I've been curious about, and I'll kind of give you my take on it, and I want to see what you think. Mm -hmm. um, if there were not a magisterial definition mm -hmm. on the immaculate conception, <clears throat> I would probably maintain it 
by way of saying that it would be fitting and sure. that it does seem that there's some some mm -hmm. attestation to it um but i i would maintain that it's it's kind of a theologumenon okay you know something mm -hmm. that is you know we can agree to disagree on when we have however a magisterial yep. definition now now it's a dogmatic we can't agree to disagree without a doubt that's definitive right but i'm just saying if there had not been a definition i would lean in that favor because i really think that it is unfitting that she would you know have the stain of original sin um what is your perspective there would you still say that oh you know i'm i'm all for the immaculate conception or i'm not really for it if there weren't a, a, a definition yeah. and and i've looked at it from both perspectives michael i have yeah. looked at it from both and and i truly believe that even if there were not a a, a official uh definition there i think the evidence very strongly does lean there mm -hmm. particularly because even before we get to that dogmatic definition mm -hmm. in 1854 uh, the tour de force defense from the great blessed Don Scotus to me mm -hmm. is just a magnificent defense from the scripture, from the early church fathers. He, look, he recognized that the early fathers, sure, there were many that didn't teach it, but I think that what blessed Don Scotus must have seen, by the way, I want to be very clear. I know some people uh, will say, well, you know what? He, he only arrived at it by saying, oh, well, it was just fitting. Mm -hmm. No, it was much more than that. Uh, he was an incredible luminary. Now, I think that he looked in the early church and recognized once we get to a certain time where language and knowledge has developed enough, where they're beginning to talk about conceptions mm -hmm. and they begin to include Holy Mary in the conversation, there really is no doubt about Holy Mary's conception being an all immaculate one. Mm -hmm. Now it is an area where St. Thomas, um, he got it wrong. Mm -hmm. and, and of course it's an example that some of the greatest minds sure. can get something like this wrong. But, but don't, I, don't don't you think that it's odd that somebody as knowledgeable yeah. as as Aquinas got this one wrong? Maybe speak yeah. to that a little bit. Yeah, you know, it really is odd. It is unfortunate as well. But I, I'll use another example, Michael. One of the greatest biblical scholars, saints, and doctors of the church, Saint Jerome. Yeah. Originally got the canon wrong as well. He yeah. yeah, yeah. Wrong. <laughs> yeah. Now, of course. <laughs> but I tell you one thing, Michael. Uh, had the church at the time of Saint Thomas Aquinas decided to dogmatize it he would have yielded to, oh, yeah. to the church without a doubt and what does saint jerome do he yields to the authority of the church so yeah. it, it goes right back to an area where your expertise is in the magisterium mm -hmm. and it's a very important area and i think it really is what separates us from many of these other churches and, and it, it truly is a beauty that we have that and i've even seen language in jerome that i think was after yeah. um you know what he kind of wrote commenting on the canon where he indicates that he yields to the authority of the church on the issue that's of the correct canon, so. in fact there's even one uh one piece of text and by the way i i can't take full credit for it. gary who is yeah. a canon nerd uh yeah. found a very very interesting piece where jerome in reference to everything says look yield to the authority of pope innocent mm -hmm. and well what was pope innocent urging and teaching that the deuter canon was holy writ yeah now <clears throat> let's um let me maybe ask this um when it comes to the immaculate conception are there any concerns that you have with that doctrine and how did you maybe overcome some of those concerns yeah one of them michael and it may really seem superficial to you yeah. but when i first became catholic it was a stumbling block the fact that well mary does tell everybody everybody reading the gospel that i need a savior yeah but she says uh, i rejoice in the lord my savior so mm -hmm. here i am thinking well goodness mm -hmm. as this was a freshly converted william all right think well how does mary need a savior you know i thought that mary was preserved from any kind of sin yeah. so it was perplexing to me but here is the beauty of sacred scripture michael in the fact that mary is quoting hannah's hymn hearkening mm -hmm. to it not mm -hmm. quoting it directly but very close to yes. doing it and as you know very well, it is talking about a, a, uh, a holy birth. It is talking about a miraculous birth mm -hmm. in, uh, in uh, 2 Samuel, I believe, mm -hmm. Hannah's hymn. And if you look in Hannah's hymn, the very similar word is used. Not Savior, but I rejoice in the Lord my salvation. Well, okay. it's very similar language. And Mary is hearkening to the fact that this is a wonder child, okay. a miraculous birth, as was hannah's because she was barren before that birth so 
I look at that when you look at that and you realize, okay, but then there's more to it. Yeah. The fact that in the Old Testament, the Greek Septuagint, that Greek word soter for savior, mm -hmm. it's not used the way people that right. object to it would want it to be used. It's talking about being saved in an external manner, not yes. for a inwardly yes. moral defect. And if Mary, Holy Mary, is hearkening to a text from the Septuagint, yeah. well, she'd be using it in the very same manner, not saying, hey, I'm a sinful person. And I think that's important. That's incredibly important because I think that oftentimes, um, especially those of us who are former evangelicals, we come from this perspective that we interpret certain words yeah. like salvation in a way that is a little bit divorced from the um, biblical context and the Hebraic roots that they yeah. have. So say salvation does not always mean, though it can, it does not always mean, you know, salvation from personal sin or something yeah. like that. It could most certainly involve that or mean that directly. Yep. At other times, it could refer to something else, like you said, more external or even corporate. Um, Definitely. And that's something that often gets overshadowed here, pun intended. Uh <laughs> Great pun. I, I wouldn't have noticed it. Great job. So, all right. Tell me a little bit about the work that you've done with Father Coppice and also his work on the Immaculate Conception and maybe how it helps uh, perhaps some Eastern Orthodox who are yep. watching the show that have concerns that, okay, well, I think that the Immaculate Conception is something that the Magisterium just kind of came up with. This is yeah. not um, patristic. Could you maybe speak to his work and your work along with him? Definitely. So I'm trying to remember. It's been two years already. When yeah, I, yeah. I met Father Coppins about right. two years back. Became very good friends with him. We talk very, very often. Great priest. Incredible scholar. Now, when I first met him, he had written in a great book, and it was on... The Immaculate Conception, yeah. primarily in the Eastern Wasn't Church. that his his first doctoral dissertation? It sure was. It sure was. Yeah. Great, great book. Uh, I got in touch with him. I talked to him, and I remember the, one of the first things he told me was um, that he was so upset that he was going to have to rewrite that book because I was able to help find figures that he had not oh, wow. stumbled upon before. But, uh, of course, he's a Greek scholar. He did incredible yeah. translations, and we began working together. We still work together. Uh, he's a very near and dear friend to me. And in my opinion, Michael, I don't think there's a better Mariologist yeah. alive today. He's the top Mariologist in the world, does amazing work. Uh, he wrote that book, and then we wrote a book together, mm -hmm. The Definitive Guide to Solving Biblical Questions About Mary. Yeah. And in that book, we deal with, from a primarily biblical perspective, the Marian teachings from the Bible. Uh, but apart from that as well, we also put together a book on transubstantiation, and uh, we do a number of shows every now and then. He's been in the show multiple times as well, and uh, we're continuing to do work together relevant to the topic today, which is Mary. There's a God willing, hopefully, either this year or later this year, most likely, we put in out a book on the perpetual virginity of Mary. Okay. So that's one area where we're also very proud. Um, in the sense that, and anytime I say we're proud, it's not because of any glory for us. We're mm. proud that we're able to give any little bit of honor and veneration to Holy Mary. In the sense that there really is no book you can think about. They're devoted 100% to the perpetual virginity. And the book will have brand new translations that Father Coppice has done that don't exist in English. Some of them. Uh, and it, it's been a lot of fun working with them. It still is fun working with them. And uh, hopefully he'll watch the replay of the show because i know he is so busy michael <laughs> i know <laughs> i can only imagine so he's the dean over there of uh yeah. byzantine catholic yep. seminary yeah he's got a lot of great people there right yeah. yeah that to me that's the mecca of eastern catholicism <laughs> nobody could argue no one can argue against them michael they got great guys over there they're an example they really are an example and i think that um people should check them out most certainly in fact i think they have a online masters that, yeah. that people could do if they want to yep. get a Eastern Catholic um, degree. In fact, I've thought of, um, although it's not specifically Eastern Catholic, I think you could also be Eastern Orthodox there. It's it's, right. it's more just kind of Byzantine. Right. Um, but I've actually thought whenever I'm done with my doctorate, maybe doing a second master's over there, just just so I can kind of get right. something. That now, is let Eastern. me toss up, yeah, yeah, Michael. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me ask you this, uh, because this is where, where I come from. Right. I think that Having that, uh, those Eastern knowledge of the Eastern Church, yeah. of the Eastern Fathers, will make you more well rounded. Yes, I think we need that in Catholicism. Yes, I really, really do. And I, I think I've had people reach out to me and tell me, 
a lot of people that, hey, we love the work you all are doing there, mm -hmm. Reason and Theology. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's an area where people really need to dig in more. And there is not a lot of work being done there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it rounds you off much better. The sense that you'll truly be able to appreciate this beautiful, these beautiful figures of the church and tend to get forgotten. I, I think so. I think we need to really go to both traditions. No doubt. Um, I'm not one of those that says, oh, let me just only focus on yeah. the East and those dirty <laughs> Latins, forget them. No, I, I think that Latin theology uh, ha, has many great contributions yeah. and we need to use those. Um, but we also need to do the same with the East and its contributions. Yeah. There's a lot of good things that it has that can maybe balance out some of the things that we see in the West. So I think when Without you have both and you're you're using both, you're you're kind of using all of the jewels and all of the gifts that the church has to offer. Yeah, I think that it gives us a, a more well-rounded position. So I'm I'm actually very glad you brought that up. Yeah. Yeah. So and 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 that's something I've noticed with you as well, is that you uh, focus on not only the West, yep. but also the East, you incorporate that. In fact, I think you have a lot of shows involving Eastern Mass. I do have a lot, and and I've a um, uh, tiny little spoiler alert. We'll be having a debate later this year uh, with an Eastern Orthodox scholar here in recent theology as well. We'll be debating um, purgatory. Will be one of the things that will be debated. Now, uh, now I bring that up because we deal a lot with with uh, Eastern the Eastern tradition, and we think it's so important not only to have debates, Michael, but to understand the theology. Now, people have asked me before, okay, well, you know, why do you focus on figures like St. Gregory Palamas, Joseph Brienius, and these others? Well, if, if you look at the writings of Palamas, Michael, you can clearly tell Palamas was inf influenced by many Latin writers. So mm. um, that, to me, does say a lot. Um, in fact, Father Coppice, uh, this is incredible. I think he, was, he just presented a paper at Oxford. I mean, mm. This guy never rests. He's always doing stuff. And at Oxford, the paper he presented is showing the Latin material Palamas has relied upon in his writings. Mm. And we should not be, here's a message to my Eastern Catholic brothers and sisters. Mm. Don't be anti-Latin. Uh, yeah. it, there's yeah. a lot of beauty in the Latin church. And Michael, I don't know if you've ever encountered it. Oh, but, I have. <laughs> Uh, I encounter it often. Yeah. Where they'll, I, in fact, I've been told, uh, well, look, I'm I'm Eastern Catholic, mm. and uh, we shun things like the Rosary. <laughs> well, we we should not be so harsh with right. each other. We're right. brothers and sisters, and we're Catholic. Yeah, I think what it is is they're reacting mm. against a valid concern, and that sure. is there have been some Latinizations of the East, especially right. its litur liturgical tradition. And I think they're trying to avoid that, which is which is good. I mean, the church yeah. says that, yeah, we should not Latinize the, the yep. Eastern churches, Vatican Zeus or, or non-Byzantine. Right. Yeah. Vatican Zeus is big on that. But they, I think, sometimes overreact. Oh, yeah. And so we need to balance that out. Again, take the good from the Western tradition yeah. um, instead of overreacting to it. I mean, I think it's St. Paul who says, all good things are yours. Whatever the Latins have to offer that is good, take it and yep. use it. Yep. Um, but also, also, you know, on the flip side, whatever the East has to offer, take it, use yeah. it. All those things are yours. Yeah, I totally agree. And, and look, I've walked into, I have walked into Eastern Catholic churches, and they are vibrant. They are, they love the Lord. They love uh, Holy Mother Mary. And Michael, I've walked into Latin churches where they love the Lord. Yeah, and they love Holy Mother Mary, and that's great. Yeah. We, we want people to be vibrant and in fire for the faith because we want people to get to mass. And we want people to keep Holy Mother Church thriving. Sure. And I think that that's the important thing, ultimately. Well, certainly. Now, I don't want to go too far down a rabbit trail here, but you did bring it up. Mm -hmm. And I know we also have Protestants who are watching. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm very grateful that they're, they're watching. Yeah. But I know they're probably wondering in their mind, whenever you spoke about the perpetual virginity of yep. Mary, they're probably wondering... Why? Why? Yeah. Why do you guys teach that she remained a virgin? What's the deal behind this? Yeah. I mean, isn't it good to to have marital relations in a marriage? Yeah. And she was married, so maybe if you could speak to that yeah. very briefly. Yeah, there there really is no doubt that Mary was married, betrothed to Joseph. We're told Saint mm -hmm. Joseph, and 
it is normal to have marital relations uh, when you're married. I do want to note that despite noting that it is normal, it was not exclusively done. Mm -hmm. We read that there were some Jewish groups that abstained. Um, and in fact, we even read of a particular Jewish group uh, very early on called the Therapeutae that are living ascetic lives and they're older. These are older people. They're married and they're living as virgins. Mm. And, but to get to the point of, of holy marrying, why? Well, Mary, I've heard, I've heard this over and over. And I think it is, it is a fitting reply that holy Mary is presented as the new Ark of the covenant mm. and Mary's words to the angel were perplexing words. She's perplexed actually. And she says, you know, how can this be? I I know not man. Mm. Now, as we've detailed, very we've put it out forth in the book. I've brought it forth in debate. Sure, it's very clearly hearkening to Judges eleven, okay. and we've got multiple early fathers that know. In fact, first let me say this: we have a lot of fathers that believe okay. Mary took a vow of virginity. Okay, and we have multiple fathers as well that believe. Is, okay. Isn't that in the Proto Evangelion? Sure Jesus? is. Yeah. It sure is very early on. It's a great point you bring that up, Michael, because yeah. it's very early on. It's in the 100s, and we can find in the two, three, four. We find it in every era that Mary was perpetually vowed. Mary is hearkened to the words of Judges 11, Jephthah's daughter, who mm -hmm. died a perpetual virgin, uttering mm -hmm. particular words that are keying the audience into her role as a vowed virgin. Well, then we also look in the Gospel of St. Mark. This is one of the most interesting ones, Michael, because mm -hmm. in there, you frequently have Protestants say, well, Michael, William, you got the names of the brothers of there, Joseph, Judas, uh, Simon, um, and the sisters. What's going on here? How can you tell me that Mary never had children if the names of the brothers are listed there, Michael? Well, then here's the incredible thing, Michael. When we read the Gospel of St. Mark, we get to a certain passage where it talks about the brothers and sisters. And then it tells you right there, they were kinsmen. They were relatives. And it utilizes a particular Greek word that is never, ever utilized for children from the same mother, ever. And it's identifying the, the, the relation of those brothers and sisters to our Lord. So on the one hand, we're told they're brothers and sisters, but then we're told how are they? Okay. brothers and sisters. And I want to add in the book of Romans chapter nine, St. Paul uses a very same uh, Greek usage. He'll call people brothers and he'll identify how hmm. Josephus does the same as well. So we find that utilized often. Uh, and I think the important thing to note is when you look there in the gospel of St. Mark, because the other objection, Michael, and I think as a Catholic, we need to answer. Yeah. Here's the one thing that I have, I've always been bothered by this, Michael. When a Catholic, they'll ask you, well, you know, the Greek word for brother appears there in sister. Right. The Catholic will reply, well, you know, that doesn't always mean brother or sister. Well, tell them how in the context, because they don't want to hear that. They know that. Right. Show them in the context it doesn't. And in the context, they're identified as relatives, not brothers from the same mother. There's a question here from Cosmic Catholic mm -hmm. that I want to get to. Um and, and just FYI for everybody, y'all go ahead and put your questions there in the chat. Make sure to put them to at reason and theology so I can pick them out and distinguish them from comments. Otherwise, if you don't put at reason and theology, I'm probably not going to see it. get lost. The, yeah. So this one is from, uh, like I said, Cosmic Catholic. What Marian dogmas slash doctrines, if any, do you think you would hold if you were Protestant yeah. with the research you have done on church history? Yeah, so um, number one, uh, with the research I've done in church history, yeah. I would not be Protestant. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, with that research, I just I could not be Protestant, Michael. Okay. But um, I'll tell you the one that I did hold as a Reformed, because I was a Reformed Protestant mm -hmm. for many years, Michael, and that was Mary as Mother of God. But of course, it was a it was kind of like a I would believe in it, but I didn't want to say it out loud. Mm -hmm. because it was kind of it bothered me mm -hmm. in fact i would see images of mary on the tv or anywhere and i just did not like them that is drilled into you as a protestant michael number right. one we don't like images um number two we we don't think uh mary should be venerated we didn't i mean 
I'm right. referring to myself in the past tense. I am no longer a Protestant sure. because, uh, you know, people that watch us will say, oh, he's talking in the present tense. He's, you know, he's still a Protestant. Still a Protestant. Yeah, you so, fooled us. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, you guys, you have cardboard books and you're still Protestants. I mean, <laughs> oh, we've got to do a video before I leave. <laughs> we have to. Yeah, I'm going to get a picture of you holding one of these books. Oh, this. <laughs> <laughs> so there's another good question here. Uh, same questioner, Cosmic Catholic. Is Mary's freedom from actual sin a dogma? That is, yeah. is it included in the definition of the Immaculate Conception? Yeah, so that's a, a, a great question. And it is logically included there, mm -hmm. but we can find it even before that. So here's where I want to key him into. Mm -hmm. I want him to go, uh, right now you can Google it, Look up the Tome of Leo, Pope St. Leo the Great, and you're going to find, you know, I, I've noticed that people, when they look it up and they read it, they're blown away. Because mm -hmm. I hadn't noticed it until Father Kopp has laid it out and he said, read it, go read it again. It talks about our Lord and his human nature. And if you look at the language there, it says that uh, the nature he took from his mother was a nature that did not have guilt. And it's very clear it's talking about the nature not being a sinful nature. So you can dial it back all the way right back then to Chalcedon, where it's very, very clearly being taught there. And of course, it is logically wrapped up right in there in the Immaculate Conception. If she didn't have that stain of original sin, without a doubt, she would not have that proclivity to commit personal sins. This one is from Father John Brown, S.J., Please compare, contrast Mary's salvation to ours. Yep. For example, could Mary have lost her salvation through sin like we can? Yeah, that's a great question. So we believe that Mary had free will. That is so important to, uh, to be taught. But we believe that Mary was so holy that Mary would not have desired to do anything apart from the will of God. So now, could Mary have lost her salvation? No, she couldn't have. Now, why not? Because it's very clear Mary was just keyed in on her role from the very beginning. As soon as we encounter Mary, mm -hmm. where Mary says, let it be done unto me according to thy word. It's a little bit of a play on words there from Luke. Luke is just a master of play on words. Because right there, he uses he utilizes the, word, the Greek word logos. Yeah. Then in Luke 11, we read that those that keep the word of God are blessed, more blessed than any other. Well, who's the very first one to hear and to keep that word in your heart? That was Mary. So Mary was present there. Mary accepted that as her role. Thus, despite having free will, Mary never had any desire other than to do everything in the path of God. Oh, let me let me answer the yeah, other yeah. part. I forgot yeah, about ahead. that. It's very different from our. Now, us, Michael, we, we are born in a kind of bent kind of manner. We need all the grace, right. all the right. grace that we can get. And of course, for us, we sin and we pick ourselves up, go to confession and we get cleaned up. So there's a very big difference because we are working towards that goal, as St. Paul says, that crown. So there's a very big difference between Mary and between our kind of salvation. Now, Mary, as the church has always taught, was preemptively saved. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that she was, um, she had sin for a moment and was saved? What does it mean? It just simply means she was prevented from ever being touched by the clutches of the devil. She was never under the dominion of the devil. Yeah, because for people who are concerned with the Immaculate Conception and, and want to deny it, yeah. I would, I would think you would have to then say, well, you're saying that there was a certain point in the Virgin Mary's life where if she had died in that moment, she would have been separated from God for yeah. all eternity. Um, I'm not willing to go there. No. <laughs> no. And especially from an Eastern tradition, I don't understand why some Eastern Orthodox say I, I reject the Immaculate Conception unless they're misunderstanding it and they think that it yeah. means she did not die or something like that. Because again, what you're saying is if you reject the Immaculate Conception, let's just be clear. You're saying that there was a point in time where she would have been damned to hell if she had died in that moment. I don't think any Orthodox wants to say that. Now, Michael, it is definitely saying just the way you laid it out. To me, I cannot imagine 
ever is saying that Holy Mary was under the dominion of the devil, because mm -hmm. that is what you're saying. We're told directly in the Book of Wisdom that that serpent is the devil. And if you claim that Mary was bent mm -hmm. or had a bent nature, mm -hmm. you are, in essence, claiming that. Now, here's the other objection, Michael, where you'll hear on their end where they will then claim, oh, well, look, um, uh, Mary very clearly had a bent nature because she had a human nature. Well, that doesn't indicate that she would have had a bent nature. Uh, that's a very uh, flawed kind of position to take. So I think that the main thing that to me blows me away, Michael, and, and I remember I was talking with Father Coppins on the phone when he began uh, breaking down the Greek of Ephesians 1, and then we looked at uh, the Greek of Luke 1, and then the commentary of St. Maximus the Confessor, and then no noting how that that kind of particular grace that Mary is in full possession of, that tells us a lot right there. And that really is mind-blowing because then you realize, okay, well, this is why this incredible woman is being portrayed as the new Ark of the New Covenant. And indeed, she is that Ark because in the book of Revelation, that is very clearly laid out. Here's an interesting question here. Um, it, well, let, let, let me ask it like this. Did you did you see the recent debate with Trent Horn on the Immaculate Conception? I was able to catch a little bit. I didn't get to watch all of it. I I, I was able to look at a little bit of the cross examination. Yeah, um, a little bit of it. What What did you think from what you saw? Uh, I think as usual, I think Trent did a fantastic yeah. job. Uh, I, I I don't think that the uh, objections from the interlo his interlocutor mm -hmm. were good. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think they were good at all. Uh, and I think he did a very good job. But I was not able to watch the whole right. debate. But uh, but the from what thing. I read, he did a incredible job this is from parker manning and by the way thank you for the super chat here so he is asking um pro well hmm, protestants use luke 1 4 7 as evidence mary was a sinner but do you think this is actually evidence for the immaculate conception basically saying she was already saved hope you're doing well by the way working on the book as i listen Parker, I, I believe Parker uh, has reached out to me before. He's working on a book, uh, God willing, hopefully everything's going well there. Um, I'll be praying for you, Parker. Uh, you do bring up a very good point there, Parker, because you're right there. It does indicate that Mary is saved at that particular time. What a Protestant will then say, though, is they'll say, well, of course, Mary is indicating she's saved, but she's still indicating she was saved because of sin. Now, it, it does work to show that Mary, the language Mary is using, is indicative of a woman that is in a state of complete justice, the kind of language the Latin church loved to use, particularly St. Augustine. But I think the most important thing we've got to really double down on, Parker, mm. is why does Mary even use that kind of language? Mm. And that kind of language is very clearly hearkening to Hannah's hymn. And the wonderful things that have been done for her. That, that, by the way, very odd language because that indicates God did something incredible for her in the past. And the, the Reverend Dr. Brown, who, of course, was quite liberal, was quite perplexed and admitted this is, this is very unique language being used for this woman. Uh, something special is, is being indicated here. And uh, a Catholic would reply and say, well, yeah, that special thing is very clearly Mary was immaculately conceived. This is from Derek, and Derek, thank you so much for the super chat. How might a well-studied Protestant respond to Jesus being sinless, but still being conceived by a mother that also had original sin? Hope that makes sense. It does, Michael, and and even though we do not uh, agree with it, you will find the theology laid out in, in uh, John Calvin, and uh, much more in depth in Francis Turretin. So once you get to the time of Francis Turretin. Um, it is laid out, but Michael, I have to be very clear to you. Uh, I would recommend anybody get a hold of the works of John Calvin and Francis Turretin. By the way, it's unfortunate that the, the work of Turretin, uh, I believe it's a, a lentic theology, mm -hmm. is not available online for free. I'd recommend that people can find a cheap copy, get a copy. They have a lot of trouble. Now, what trouble do they have? When you get to Francis Turretin and he begins to talk about the birth of Christ, mm -hmm he really does struggle with arguing that Mary had original sin, sin Christ doesn't have, to the point of even arguing in an almost nonsensical manner. 
where you begin to encounter multiple reformers arguing that the way Christ was born is in a very odd way to where the nature, the human nature was given to him at a very late time. It's just such an odd way that they talk about that conception. The way they do that is the reason they do that is because they are trying as much as possible to avoid the fact that, hey, he received this from his mother. <laughs> and it's really tough for a lot of these Protestant theologians to accept that. And I want to say the reason I'm un unable to break it down very clearly is because it is not clear. It doesn't make any sense the way they argue about the way Christ was born. It, it doesn't make sense. Now, I also want to be clear. Uh, the dogma doesn't say that Mary was immaculately conceived because she had to pass an immaculate human nature over to Christ. I have heard that argument put forth by Catholics before, and that is not part of the dogma. This is from Catholic Gabe. How do you reconcile the immaculate conception with, let's say, scriptural verses like Romans 3.23? <laughs> yeah, what do you think? Yeah, that's a, 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 uh, a great question. So when you look at Romans 3 and you look at these other passages, here's the amazing thing, Michael. They're talking about personal sins. And when we look at all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, there are exceptions. If we're going to look and say that there are no exceptions, well, you're going to tell me that a newly born infant is not an exception. A newly born infant is committed an actual sin. Or what about uh, people, and this is an unfortunate example, people that are born mentally retarded. Mm -hmm. They cannot be uh, said to commit personal sins. Mm -hmm. The idea is St. Paul there is talking about, in general, humanity is fallen. Humanity are sinful. He's not including every single person, Michael, because if he was, then he'd have to include Christ there as well. It just logically does not compute, does not make any sense at all. Let's see here. Why did Mary die or get sick if she was born without original sin? We kind of touched on that earlier as far as the yeah. death issue. But can you maybe touch on the issue of sickness? Did the Virgin Mary get sick? Yeah. So very interesting question, Michael, because if you look at multiple fathers, they will a lot of the times not go into the language of Mary getting sick and dying, but they'll talk about Mary being aged, mm. being old, and indicating that she is it's her time to die. Mm. But you don't really find many fathers talking about Mary getting sick, Mary falling ill. Not that it's not possible. It's very possible that she would have uh, gotten ill. But they, they use very reverent language when they talk about her dormition. In fact, some of them, when they talk about her falling asleep, almost indicate that it's almost a, uh, something that happens immediately mm -hmm. where Holy Mary will fall asleep and then be taken directly bodily into heaven. Now, not all of them do it that way. Yeah. Multiple do. Why do they do, do they do that? Yeah. Because there's an incredible reverence for Holy Mary, incredible veneration. And I want to emphasize again, because th this to me, Michael, is the most important point. When you read the Dormition homilies, you are encountering fathers that tell you, we believe Mary died. But she didn't die because of original sin. Mm. And I want to emphasize that. St. Germanos of Constantinople, St. Andrew of Crete, Theotechnos of Livius, and John Damascene. Those are titan names. Those are pillars of the Dormition. Yeah. And when they talk about her death, they don't tell you she died because of original sin. They believe it was a very different kind of death. Now, I understand you have a big announcement to tell us about. I sure do. Let's hear about it. So we've got a lot of incredible stuff going on here at Reason on Theology. And if people haven't hit subscribe yet, I don't know what's going on, Michael. <laughs> I mean, look, I, I'm going to have to prove these are real books for them to subscribe. <laughs> Stay tuned. We are working on, now I can't give names yet, but we'll have an incredible debate either in the late fall or winter time. Mm -hmm. It will be a debate. Michael is going to be flying out. It will be somewhere in Texas. He'll be the incredible host as usual. And it'll be a debate, Catholic versus versus Muslim. We're going to be debating, will the real Mary please stand up? That's a great title. Yeah, I yeah, yeah, I like that. <laughs> who who has a better, uh, who has the correct Mary of history? Is it Catholicism 
or is it Islam? Because as we know, Michael, the Quran does talk a lot about Mary. Mm -hmm. So, And I've heard people tell me, Michael, well, you know, you're Catholic, but we've got a whole chapter about Mary, as yeah. if that means that they have the correct version. Right. And I think that when we look at what the Bible says about Holy Mary, and then we look at early history, without a doubt, we are the ones that have the true historical version of Mary. But they do have a high view of her, right? They sure do. They yeah. do. It, it's just... um. It is a high view, but it's unfortunate once we reach their scholars, the language utilized from areas is unfortunate. Okay. Uh, it's not flattering. And it's, it's, uh, it's unfortunate. So is, is it higher than your average Protestant yeah. understanding of the Virgin Mary? It usually is higher than your average Protestant because, um, you know, they'll, you'll, you'll encounter a lot of Muslims believing that Mary remained perpetual virgin, that Mary did not have any kind of sin. There's even a theology of a uh, of an assumption of Mary within Islam. So they do have a higher view of Mary. But then, of course, people will ask, well, do they, do they believe Mary was mother of God? Well, they do not. They deny our Lord was God. So then they're going to deny Mary as del tocos because they don't believe Christ was eternal God. Tell me maybe a little bit more about, and, and we're wrapping it up here, and, and by the way, we are going to be doing it second video in just a little bit you yep. know um but tell me are there any aspects of the immaculate conception that we did not touch on that you feel would be a miss if we didn't touch on them is there is there anything that we maybe missed um or did we kind of cover it all i think we we, we kind of covered a good amount mm -hmm. i would like to also add because people are probably going to wonder well you all talked about church fathers that talked about conceptions. Let me give you a, a few names. Yeah. Um, we've got the Auditus, who talks about Mary's all immaculate creation. Then when we get to Romanos and Melodis, Michael, mm -hmm. incredible early church father, by the way, inspired heavily by St. Ephraim in the kind of poetic prose that he wrote in, he talks about actual immaculate conception of Mary. Then we get to St. John Damascene, who also uses the language of all holy seed to talk about the all immaculate conception. Then we have Theotechnos of Livius mm -hmm. talks about Mary being created from immaculate clay. So there's a, a, a time where we get to multiple. Here's one thing I want to add. Mm -hmm. We get to multiple fathers and these fathers are fathers that are venerated in the Eastern church as well. Mm -hmm. Clearly teaching the immaculate conception, very clearly teaching it. And we realize that these fathers also have a very clear theology on original sin. So there are multiple fathers that clearly teach that. And I did want to bring that up so we can kind of have a complete show on the topic in case anybody comes to the show later. They'll say, hey, we've got a good amount of material here. Tell me a little bit about the work that you're doing on your own channel. Yeah. So on my channel, what I, I try to focus a lot on, Michael, is having a lot of fun. Mm. talking about theology mm. topics with friends. In fact, I'll be having you on soon. Yeah. Um, just having friends on, people sure. that I think are, first off, I want to say people I think that are reputable, that yeah. know their stuff. So um, I spend a lot of time debating, preparing for debates, and then usually in that downtime in between writing or preparing for debates, I have my friends on. We'll talk about theology. We'll yeah. have an incredible time like I'm having right now. Yeah, yeah. And really the kind of brotherhood and camaraderie it, there's really nothing like it it's great to be able to sit down and talk with a brother or a sister about the faith and you mentioned it earlier but go ahead and you know put a plug now i understand you have some books i sure do yeah. so uh we've got two books that we have out the definitive guide to solving biblical questions about marrying and the other one the secret history of transubstantiation mm. people can find both of them online easily i know a lot of people live in europe Mm. They can find them on Book Depository, or you can find them on Amazon. They can find them there. And uh, I truly think they'll be edified by them, Michael. I truly, I truly do. In fact, in both, they will find a few brand new translations of early church fathers mm. in English that cannot be found anywhere else. So I really think that they'll be edified. And we've got more material coming out. We've got a book we've been working on in the papacy perpetual virginity as well and a book that i hope to finally get out that i wrote years ago i just need to edit it down it's a mega book on purgatory so a lot of really good stuff going on god willing uh we can keep it up yeah and and um you know i 
I, I don't think you mentioned the website. Did, did my you? bad. Maybe I'm, I'm, no, may have I didn't. It. Go ahead now, and they can website. find my uh, page at www.patristicpillars.com or they can go to earlychurchfathers.com. It'll take you directly there as well. Awesome. Early church. I haven't heard of that one before. Yeah. Well, I own the domain. So I just direct people to the Patricia awesome. Pillars. That's a really smart move. There. <laughs> it really was. That's a good, good I wanted that domain decision. for a long time. <laughs> awesome. Well, William, thank you so much for coming on and doing this. Like I said, we're going to have another video, but man, Definitely. really, really good stuff. I appreciate Loved it. you. Love thank it. you. Thank you for having me. And everybody, don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Make sure to check me out also, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support me. And of course, go and subscribe to Patristic Pillars and support William and what he is doing. All right, y'all. I'll see you later. God bless. Hey, RNT fans, if you're looking to buy a home or sell a home and would like a realtor who shares your beliefs, be sure to check out our sponsor, realestateforlife.org, and be sure to tell them reason and theology sent you.